Hello everyone. So what happens when the blood sugar is low? So low blood sugar is known as hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia is not a diagnosis. Hypoglycemia is a clinical sign. It is not a diagnosis. What that means is that we always have to look for why the hypoglycemia is happening because there's always a reason that it's happening. So hypoglycemia is not a diagnosis. Nevertheless, hypoglycemia is something we can recognize and that we have to treat. Regardless of what the cause is, we're going to treat it in generally the same way uh, in addition to treating the underlying cause. So just to re remember, hypoglycemia is not a diagnosis. What it is, low level of glucose, you should know that. The normal level of blood glucose is generally accepted between 70 and 120, and symptoms are usually going to appear when the blood glucose drops below 50, but there's no necessarily direct correlation between symptoms and glucose level. Some patients can have a glucose level of 40 and be asymptomatic. Some patients may have uh, a blood glucose level of 65 and be very symptomatic. So. You should look for the symptoms and look for a blood glucose level of less than 70. What are the symptoms? So the symptoms of hypoglycemia are basically similar to some of the symptoms that you get in diabetes, minus the polyuria and polydipsia. Now your body thinks, remember in diabetes, your body thinks it's starving. And that's because you can't get sugar into your cells. And so your body comes up with all of these all of these symptoms, as you can see here, sweating, tremor, tachycardia, palpitation, anxiety, nausea, vomiting, uh, altered level of consciousness. We see that in, in diabetes in, in patients with DKA or, or HHS. However, the difference with hypoglycemia is that your body really is starving. You don't have glucose. Uh, and it's not that your body can't take it in, it's that you don't have any left. So the symptoms are going to include the sympathetic activation that you see in patients who are, uh, who are insulin deprived, but you can also see some other things like blurred vision and behavioral changes. But the symptoms are pretty similar, just for the fact that you don't, just uh, minus the fact that in hypoglycemia, you don't have polyuria, you don't have polydipsia, you definitely are not going to have glucosuria, you're not going to have ketone bodies, uh, but uh, in general, the symptoms are kind of similar with the sympathetic activation. So the symptoms, as I mentioned, sympathetic activation, blurred vision, behavioral changes, fatigue, altered level of consciousness. Some patients, even if their glucose levels drop a little bit, they can get a little, a little angsty, a little crabby. Uh, the history in any hypoglycemic is going to be important. Uh, if a patient has hypoglycemia, a lot of times you're going to come to that uh, I hate to say the word diagnosis because it's not a diagnosis, but you'll find out that they have hypoglycemia before you figure out what's causing it. So getting the history is going to be really important to figure out what the underlying cause of the hypoglycemia is so that we can either treat that or we can prevent it from happening in the future. Uh, so what we're going to want to know is we're going to want to know what medications they're on. We're going to want to know if the patient is a diabetic so we can find out if they're on insulin or on antihyperglycemics. And if you remember back to my diabetes lecture that I gave, particularly sulfonylureas are the oral antihyperglycemics that are associated with hypoglycemia. We also want to know if the patient's had any bariatric surgery. And that's because uh, one of the... Uh, operations that are done, really any anything monkeying around with the stomach and small intestine in that area can, can result in, in dumping syndrome. But particularly the Ruin Y uh, uh, gastrojejunostomy is a surgical procedure that's, uh, that can cause hypoglycemia. And I'll talk about why that is in a little bit. To diagnose hypoglycemia, to figure out that it's there, it's as easy as just getting a finger stick glucose test. And the treatment, if the patient is alert and is able to, you can give them oral glucose intake 
fruit juice is generally good. Something with very simple uh, sugars, not complex carbs, but simple sugars like fruit juice or or Skittles or Starbursts or some kind of candy. Um, those are usually uh, good. Something that's going to spike the glucose level up quickly. If the patient is uh, obtunded or if the patient has an altered level of consciousness where we don't want to be giving them anything by mouth, then you can start uh, IV 50% dextrose. And of course, like I said, this just depends on the, under, or on the patient's status. And you're going to want to be treating the underlying cause, looking into what the underlying cause may be. And a lot of times the history will point you to that. It's not as difficult as it might sound. So what are some of the causes of hypoglycemia? This is not a comprehensive list, but it's, I would say, the most common causes, uh, as well as some of the zebras that the USMLE likes to throw at you. So there's diabetic-related hypoglycemia, uh, too much insulin, uh, maybe the patient dosed wrong, maybe they took insulin from the wrong bottle, maybe they, uh, uh, who knows, too much antihyperglycemic, maybe they got started on too high of a dose, Exercise, remember that muscles do not require insulin to pull glucose in. So if you go uh, and do some running or you do some weightlifting and then you use your regular amount of insulin or your regular dose of antihyperglycemic, then you're at risk for hypoglycemia. Insufficient intake, and that's really true for any of us, but particularly patients who are on insulin or antihyperglycemics. Their doses are based on the fact that they're eating. If you're not eating, you don't need insulin. So Insufficient intake uh, can be related to hypoglycemia and diabetics as well. And then autonomic neuropathy, that's a little bit more complex of a cause having to do with the nerves that supply uh, the small intestine and pancreas. Postprandial hypoglycemia, this is something that you're going to see in your post-surgical patients. So what dumping syndrome is, it's more of a surgical condition because it's a post-surgical uh, complication. But what happens is that when you do a gastrectomy, you're reducing the volume of your of your stomach. And what's happening is food is pretty much going from your esophagus into a little pouch and then straight into your small intestine. Rather than having the food digested fully by the stomach and very uh, gradually released into the small intestine, uh, you're basically just dumping in your food into your small intestine. And what happens then is that the small intestine is going to overreact and is going to stimulate a very high amount of insulin release. Meanwhile, you're not absorbing that the, the nutrients from that food uh, very quickly. You're, you're absorbing it at normal rate, but your insulin is going to spike. And so that's what dumping syndrome is. So the insulin level spikes, but you're not absorbing the glucose fast enough and so you'll go into a hypoglycemia. And so that's why uh, the uh, patients who have bariatric surgery are at risk for hypoglycemia. Galactosemia is an inherited condition. It's autosomal recessive. Uh, that's usually something that a child would be diagnosed with at birth. Infection can cause hypoglycemia. Liver disease, because the liver is responsible for gluconeogenesis. Hypothyroidism can result in hypoglycemia. Ethanol-induced hypoglycemia, because it, uh, um, alcohol, ethanol, uh, inhibits the liver from uh, producing gluconeogenesis. So that can cause hypoglycemia. Factitious hyperinsulinism, this would be a patient who's just actually shooting up insulin that doesn't belong to them, or perhaps they're a diabetic patient and they're pur purposefully giving themselves too much insulin. This is uh, a factitious disorder, so this is actually classified under psychiatric disorders. And then an insulinoma, and this is unusual. Insulinomas are quite rare. What it is is it's a, a benign tumor of the pancreas. And uh, factitious hyperinsulinism and insulinoma, as well as, uh, as well as overdose of sulfonylureas, can be differentially diagnosed, and I'll show you a table on how to differentiate those. So you're going to want to work up for the cause. As I mentioned, the history is very important. So you're going to want to ask yourself, is the patient a diabetic? What medications is the patient on? Is the patient, has the patient been taking any street drugs? Have they had gastric bypass? Do they drink alcohol? Those are all questions you definitely want to ask the patient. You also want to uh, 
ask or look, I suppose, if, to see if there's any signs of infection. So does the patient have a fever? Do they have low blood pressure? Is there a rash? Do they have crackles or rails in their lung fields? Uh, do they have uh, urethritis? Do they have pain on urination? Uh, is there any wound anywhere? Do they have a headache? Those are all questions you'll think of as far as an infection, locating a source. The labs you're going to want to get. Now, these are not, you don't have to get all of these labs. The, I would say the first five or six you'd probably want to get. Um, but these are all labs that uh, could be useful in working up a cause of hypoglycemia. So a CBC and a CMP are always useful. Um, your CMP will show you your glucose level. CBC will be helpful to see if there's any kind of infection. A liver panel will be good to see if there's uh, liver failure going on. Thyroid function tests can uh, suggest uh, a uh, hypothyroidism. Uh, a uh, blood alcohol level can suggest if possibly this patient has got alcohol-induced hypoglycemia. A plasma insulin level is useful to see if they have a high insulin level, either due to exogenous insulin, either due to an insulinoma. Uh, a C-peptide level is going to be useful for differentiating exogenous insulin uh, that is shot up uh, from you know prescription insulin from uh, from regular insulin that your body creates. And then urine sulfonylurea to see if uh, the patient uh, is on sulfonylurea, and that may mean that they've got an overdose of sulfonylurea, or if it's a patient who's not prescribed a sulfonylurea, that they've taken uh, sulfonylureas and that's lowering their uh, glucose level. Or if it's a child who's gotten into uh, perhaps their grandma or their mom or dad's drugs, uh, urine sulfonylurea would be good in, to get in a case of hypoglycemia in a child who's found next to an empty pill bottle. And then a toxicology panel uh, to look for any kind of uh, illicit drug use. And like I said, choose labs based on suspicion. But I would say always get a CDC, CMP, liver panel, thyroid panel, and uh, ethanol, and probably your plasma insulin level too. So as far as hyperinsulinism, these are three things that can cause hyperinsulinism. So insulinoma, obviously it's a tumor that's secreting insulin. Exogenous insulin, meaning you're getting it from outside your body. And sulfonylurea, sulfonylureas are a secretagogue and they cause increased release of, it, of endogenous insulin. So what's important to remember here, okay, here's these four labs, plasma, insulin, C-peptide, pro-insulin, and urine sulfonylurea. What's important to know for these labs is that pro-insulin is the precursor to insulin. So it's a protein that hasn't yet been cleaved in and matured into insulin. Once pro-insulin is, is matured into insulin, a part of it is cut off. So you have pro-insulin, a part of it's cut off. That part is called C-peptide. So you have then your mature insulin and your C-peptide. Now, if you're getting insulin from an exogenous source, you just get insulin. You don't have pro-insulin. And so you also won't get as much C-peptide. So a patient who has, uh, who's getting exogenous insulin, unlike patients who get insulinomas, where they're getting their own endogenous insulin, or sulfonylureas, where they're releasing more of their own endogenous insulin, patients with, uh, with exogenous insulin administration will have C-peptide levels that are low. And that sets it apart from insulinoma and sulfonylureas, which are both other conditions where you'll have a high plasma insulin. The pro-insulin level will be high in insulinoma. Why? Because you're increasing the production of insulin. As you increase the production of insulin, your pro-insulin level goes up because you're increasing the production. With exogenous insulin, you're just giving yourself insulin, so there's no pro-insulin involved. With sulfonylureas, you're just increasing the secretion of insulin that's already there, so your pro-insulin level is still going to be normal. And with urine sulfonylurea, that's pretty obvious. You can get a sulfonylurea level either via urine or via serum, and the sulfonylurea level will be high in patients that have taken sulfonylureas. So as I mentioned, and I just want to stress this, uh, that patients who have factitious insulinemia, who are getting exogenous insulin, 
they will not have pro-insulin or C-peptide because pro-insulin is the precursor to insulin and C-peptide is that part of endogenous insulin that's cleaved off. So patients who have high insulin but low C-peptide or normal C-peptide, that is suggestive of exogenous insulin, probably factitious hyperinsulinemia. And so that's how you're going to distinguish that from uh, the others. So overall, the treatment is to ensure that the glucose levels are greater than or equal to 70 milligrams per deciliter, and this is done by monitoring symptoms and by frequent finger stick glucose tests. The patient can be discharged once the underlying cause is found. We do not want to discharge the patient unless we know what's likely causing the uh, hyperinsulinemia or the low blood sugar because we don't want them to have another episode and perhaps not be able to get help. So some of the underlying causes, and it's generally pretty easy based on the history to find the underlying cause. Most commonly, diabetic medication related. So what you can do with that is you can change the dosage, diabetes education, helping them be aware that if you do go work out, that's fine, but make sure that you're taking your blood glucose before your meal and that you don't take as much glucose perhaps uh, perhaps ask your physician for a sliding scale. Those aren't things you need to don't know for the USMLE, but just know that diabetic medication can cause, uh, can cause hypoglycemia and that exercise can uh, be a cause as well. Dumping syndrome, the thing you're going to want to tell these patients who had gastric bypass, and they should generally know this, their bariatric surgeon should tell them this before they're discharged. Uh, but smaller and more frequent meals throughout the day is going to be helpful for these patients so that they don't have that sudden dumping of, of food into their small intestine and get that huge spike in insulin levels. So smaller, more frequent meals through the day. Infection, of course, if it's, anti uh, it's going to be antibiotics, you want to ensure their fluid status and supplemental glucose and dextrose. If it's ethanol-induced, so if you have a drunk patient when you give the D50, particularly, uh, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a drunk patient who's not responsive, if you're giving that D50 IV, you're going to want to supplement that with thiamine and folic acid. If the patient has an insulinoma, which would be diagnosed via CT, uh, that will be uh, treated with surgery or with the insulin uh, inhibitor octreotide. And factitious hypoglycemia, Obviously, that's going to uh, be psychiatric treatment and cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's it.